This is Reimagining Higher Education, your go-to podcast with remarkable education leaders sharing personal stories from their experience in and around the sector, including reflection and evidence for progress in the sector. With your host, Professor Judith Sachs, former PVC Learning and Teaching at the University of Sydney, Deputy Vice-Chancellor and Provost at Macquarie University, and Special Advisor in Higher Education at KPMG, and now Chief Academic Officer at Studiosity. Welcome. Good afternoon, uh, Prof Professor Glover. Thank you for making time to talk to me this afternoon as part of the Studiosity uh, podcast series. Um, before we start, Studiosity acknowledges the traditional Indigenous custodians of country throughout Australia and all of the lands where we work and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to elders past and present. So welcome to the podcast, Barney, if I can be informal. Yes. Um, you uh, have had um, a very interesting uh, academic career. You've worked in universities that have been um, challenging, both in terms of their location, but also aspirational. So um, your time at um, uh, Charles Darwin University was characterised by transformation and change and, and, and re repositioning it. Your time at Newcastle as a um, DVC research was also about repositioning and, and developing a much more focused research culture. And at Western Sydney, well, I think that uh, what you've done is brought together a really complex set of federated campuses uh, to be unified but distinctive. Um, so, and you've also created a much greater presence within the community. So. You, you are um, a, a vice chancellor who has reimagined uh, higher education. And so part of our conversation today will be about reimagining higher education. But before we do that, I think people like to hear a little bit about the stories of vice chancellors and the things that have shaped them as leaders, but also as, um, as educators and really senior academics. So I asked you to bring a, an object um, that represented your journey as an education leader uh, and scholar, but also that is part of who you are uh, as as a as an educator and scholar. So, what what did you consider bringing? Thanks, Judith. It is uh, great to have a chance to chat to you. We've known each other for way too long, so it's not. Uh, <laughs> we, we were young then. <laughs> we, we were young then, and it's good to have a chance to to talk to you about um, universities and education and and uh, the challenges of our sector, a sector you've been involved with for uh, as long as I have, I think, if not longer. So it's, it's great to be with you. Look, I reflected a lot about uh, the object and because I started out my working life um, as a teacher in secondary schools in Victoria, in country Victoria, I thought a lot about uh, a piece of chalk because it sort of reflected a little bit of where my teaching career began, um, using to learning to to use a blackboard effectively as a as a way of conveying information in a mathematics classroom in country Victoria in the early 1980s. So that meant something to me, um, and I still have fond memories, very fond memories actually, of, of that period. But in the end, I decided to think more about perhaps the latter 20 years of my uh, educational journey and the role that technology has played in changing the shape of education and educators. So I chose my mobile phone as my object because I felt that if anything reflected what we, the capacity we have now in a mobile phone is an extraordinary device when it comes to what it's capable of. And as an educational tool, without doubt, we're just learning, I think, to, to uh, really understand its capabilities in so many ways, particularly coming out of a pandemic where we've relied so heavily on technology. And I know how many times I've used my mobile phone for a Zoom meeting, for example. Uh, so there's that dimension, but there's also the productivity dimension of mobile telephony. Um, because for me, as a vice chancellor, I do a huge amount of work daily on a mobile phone. So it now is a critical part of my life, my communication and my, my working life. 
And I know in many parts of the world, mobile telephony is a lot more accessible than other forms of media to influence education. So while we once talked about you know, television as a means of communicating to remote communities, quite often actually they can get access to mobile telephony much more easily than they can to other forms of um, multimedia uh, educational technology. So I chose the mobile phone as my object. And it's with you all the time. And yes, it's, it it's interesting that you've chosen that because it means you're always on call. Yeah, there is an element of that, actually. The, the, the way it has ingratiated itself into our lives and our reliance upon it. Um, if it's reassuring, it's, it's, um, it's never in my bedroom uh, it, when I go to sleep at night, but the alarm can go off uh, at various times if something particularly urgent comes through. But uh, it is, it is an extraordinary part of our lives. And I, I welcome the productivity benefit of uh, a mobile phone. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's made a huge difference. You can carry this at the end of the day, no briefcase, no other documentation necessary. And um, and you can have a video conference, you can have a teleconference, you can access some pretty sophisticated software, you can log into some systems, you can be searching the internet, you can be interacting in a whole range of ways online. It is a remarkable device, a smartphone, as it is in 2022. So, uh, you know, I, I do think it's an incredible, oh. it makes an incredible contribution to our lives. I know the downsides are there, but the upsides are significant. Interesting in New South Wales is more and more people are talking about banning mobile phones from classrooms in schools. And, and I have some sympathy for that. Mm -hmm. um, and I understand where that's coming from as, and as a former mathematics teacher in secondary schools, I can imagine one, how I would use this device because you can get some very sophisticated mathematical software on it. I have some of that um, to do some you know, quite extraordinary uh, analysis on the phone but equally you need to keep people uh, focused and attentive mm -hmm. and on task mm -hmm. in a world where you know one of the again the downsides of technology is for many people their lives are broken up into pretty small amounts of time focused on something before they flick to something else so I yeah. can understand it. So you mentioned that you were teaching in the early 80s so that means, means that you went to university in the late 70s well, what was your undergraduate uh, student experience like? Well, I loved my undergraduate student experience at Melbourne Uni in uh, starting in 1977 um, as a science student there, having finished year 12 in or form six, as it was called in Victoria then, in 1976. Um, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed lectures. I enjoyed being in a lecture theatre with uh, a great lecturer a professor teaching me mathematics and in absolutely loving that experience uh, or in chemistry or in physics. Um, it was, a, a I enjoyed that because as you know, I was a, a pretty good student. So I soaked things up pretty quickly mm -hmm. uh, in those areas I was particularly interested in. So for me, that experience that the learning part of university was, was great. I lived in a residential college, so I had a residential college experience, and you know that has um, enduring impact on people's lives. The, the social their livers, you mean? The <laughs> their liver. <laughs> yeah, well, there's that sort of dimension to it, absolutely. But it's also the relationships, the networks, yeah. the lifetime friendships that you make uh, from that experience. And then Melbourne Uni mm. in that period of time was an exciting place. Lots of things happening on a daily basis. Mm. So. Yeah, no, no, I enjoyed my experience. I, I did my undergraduate uh, degree at Melbourne. I did my honours year at Melbourne. I went and did a master's at Melbourne. I was, I was a, what was called a bonded studentship holder. So I was, um, that's what enabled me to go to university um, to be paid by the, new, by the Victorian Education Department to go to uni. And then eventually they wanted me to pay back that bond and go and teach. And I came back to my PhD later. Right. Um, rather than, so I went teaching for seven years in, in country Victoria. So I, that entire period at the University of Melbourne is one that's, uh, that's a, a, 
great memories and, and very precious to me. So when you think back on your experience and students' experiences today, very different in all sorts of, in so, all sorts of um, contexts and reasons, but what are the most stark, what are the starkest contrasts that you, you actually remember between then and now? It's a good point. There are very dramatic differences and there are very significant pressures on students mm -hmm. in 2022 that weren't the same uh, in the 1970s, in my experience of it. Mm -hmm. um, we were going through that period where higher education was free um, after the uh, election of the Whitlam government between 72 and 75. So that changed the nature of going to, to university. It was the first wave of mass or one of the first waves of massification of higher education in Australia, but still had a long way to go to what would happen in the 90s with the introduction of the higher education contribution scheme and then go forward another more than a decade in, in the context of the Bradley reform. So mm -hmm. it was we're beginning to see more students having access to higher education. There was no doubt about it. But go forward to, to 2022, the pressures are enormous. That's not all of them driven by a pandemic it's driven mm. by the nature and the frenetic nature of of our lives now and the pressures on students i know our students at western sydney of course have got a great deal of pressure on them they're they're almost all working part-time and mm -hmm. uh and you know i didn't need to work too much part-time when i went to university I, I did a few hours a week um at the village cinemas in geelong actually but anyway that's a different story um so those pressures are there so students tend to be studying less intensively because they're working and they've got family pressures, lifestyle pressures. They come onto campus in a different way if they come on at all. Mm -hmm. The way we've flipped the classroom to accommodate different styles of learning, to focus in a much more collaborative style of learning, um, that's meant that uh, students, you know, they can download a lot of material, very high quality material, before they need to step into a face-to-face -face environment with a with a tutor, a lecturer, uh, with their fellow students in projects or, or in a collaborative learning space, what we might have called a tutorial or a mm -hmm. seminar room. So we've changed the nature of it quite dramatically, and that's changed the campus experience quite significantly mm -hmm. as well. I think there are still elements of that experience at some of our GO8 universities like Sydney and Melbourne, who are essentially single campus universities. Um, Macquarie, a, a university you mm. certainly had an association with, might be similar as well, UTS in the heart of uh, Sydney. Um, but for universities, multi-campus universities, regional universities, uh, newer universities in the system, that student experience is, is very different to what it was. And of course, we get now a great deal of conversation going around about the expectations being placed on universities mm. to ensure our students are are job ready, are career ready. Um, so the sort of the fundamental educational ethos of our universities is being questioned for a utilitarian purpose in a sense. Uh, and and, of and I guess- A lot of discussion about how we can actually segment education in a way that allows students to come in and out more in that educational journey, use their skills when they need them, come back when they need to, to get more. So it's a very different context in 2022. And that means then the government performance indicators will have to change. So length of time to completion, if, if it's that sort of logic coming in and coming out, uh, upgrading skill, skills and things like that, um, could mean that um, completion rates within the shortest time is a measure of a university's success. It depends on, again, how you might define completion, because in a micro graduation, very flexible world, they might in fact be exiting with a with a micro credential which is exactly what they need they might be doing this out of an undergraduate degree not just a postgraduate degree uh, because that micro credential that three month program six month program whatever it might be might be just what they need in the context of the uh, career path they've chosen and the employment context that they're in so uh, that might count as something of a completion so we might have to I think this is one of the things we're going to have to talk about in the sector Judith, over the coming months, let alone the next few years, we've got to think a little bit about the way we credential higher education into the future. You know, what is a, how much structure do we need to put around 
micro-credentials and alternative credentials? And how can we ensure the coherency of the educational experience when we begin to stratify it in a way, particularly at undergraduate level, that might serve a purpose from an industry perspective to the sorts of skills and training mix they need for their workforce. But what does that mean in the broader context of uh, an educated and, and civil society? These are really interesting questions that we're going to have to, to ask. And I think universities are now um, being examined in that context mm -hmm. about our, our, our modus operandi, if you like, in the way we engage in the edu educational experience and whether or not we're prepared to be even more entrepreneurial. They're really big questions facing the sector, I think. So what I'm, I'm hearing you in terms of the, the, the context of this conversation about reimagining higher education, does reimagining higher education um, have at its core flexibility and flexibility of programs, flexibility of uh, Sydney University serves a different community than say um, Western Sydney University compared to Southern Cross University. So, so do we have to sort of reinforce and re redesign and rethink what's the purpose of the university? How does it fit in the, in the community? As you referred to when you were talking about the civic purpose of universities. <clears throat> Flexibility will be a part of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we still have a large number of programs which are professionally accredited. And so we need to think carefully about um, our medical graduates, our mm -hmm. architecture graduates, our uh, graduates in law or in engineering, and to ensure that you know we do have a workforce that is skilled and competent in those professional areas and so many others. So flexibility is going to be part of it because I think there is in areas, it might be, in, for example, in IT, or there might be areas of uh, of healthcare, where we might see a much more flexible, perhaps business degrees might become much more flexible than they are now. So I think there'll be an element of flexibility. Um, and what the, other elements? Just on that point, though, Judith, mm. I think the history of Australian reform of higher education is a very slow history in many ways. So we don't bring about, as you know, we don't bring about dramatic change to the basic structure of our programs very quickly. Mm -hmm. And in fact, quite rightly, we, we hold dear the quality of higher education as it's reflected through the quality of our graduates, the regulatory frameworks we operate within through TEXA and the international comparisons that we can draw from, uh, from our graduates as they're working all around the world. So we, we've got to tread carefully as we move forward in major reform. That's why I say it's part, I think, of, uh, of what, we're, what we're going to see, but it's not the whole story. So what else should be there as part of the, re the redesign, the rethinking, reimagining? Well, the, I think the credentialing is an important part of it. Flexibility yep. and credentialing are, you know, go hand in hand. We need to be, I think, conscious of the fact that uh, people like, you know, you, we've both read a lot about, I'm sure, the changing intensity of learning over a lifetime. And, uh, you know, not that long ago, the vast majority of, learning in a lifetime occurred in that period up to and including the end of undergraduate study. And then after that, the, the proportion, well, there was a continuing educational element, but it was much less intensive than that first period of life. Um, now that's changing. In fact, the shift is much more dramatic to lifelong learning, I think. There's much more of an indication that throughout the careers that people will have after perhaps an initial higher education qualification, those those lifelong experiences are going to continue and be more intense and possibly more intense than the initial higher education experience. So we've got to be adjusting and reimagining higher education in a, in a less compartmentalized way in the context of a, of a person's life, both at the undergrad and the postgrad level. So that brings about a certain amount of flexibility without a doubt, a certain amount of, of modularity in what we're doing, but also remaining able to upskill and, and bring new knowledge and, and uh, new learning to uh, the educational experience. And universities will have to adapt to that lifelong learning mantra in a much more dramatic way, not just for our alumni, and we're all thinking about ways to tap into our 
the lifelong relationship with our alumni, but it's also to attract new students uh, mm -hmm. into our programs, whether they're short courses, intensives, seminar programs, or more substantial accumulations of credentials that might make up a, an accredited program. So I think we're going to see that being a key part of reimagining higher education. I think the other element that is going to be much, much more significant than, than, and it's been a feature without a doubt of higher education for decades, but the involvement and the engagement between higher education, business and industry, um, and industry I mean broadly here, not just uh, you know, the industrial context of that sector, but importantly, the not-for-profit sector, the non-government sector, government agencies, businesses, and so on. The, a much deeper involvement between business. I think if universities don't successfully navigate and, and do successfully navigate the relationship with business and industry in that broad sense, then they are going to struggle to be relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, in the broader mm -hmm. context uh, of the, the economic future of Australia or, or anywhere else in the world. It still comes back to your civic purpose question. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and how do we ensure that we can still provide opportunities for people to explore new ideas in an environment which is rich with challenge and we're not constrained to, you're going to be an engineer, so there's a curriculum you have to follow um, we need historians and philosophers. We need anthropologists. We, we need people deeply immersed in the humanities uh, because as a society, we can't develop without that. So we've got to ensure that as we navigate our way through these changes, we still provide those opportunities to maintain and in fact, allow to flourish the humanities, the arts, the social sciences more broadly. That's, that's another one of the big mm -hmm. challenges. So you, as part of the value proposition for Western, and that's one that I, I think is very compelling, it's a university for the West of Sydney. So can you elaborate on that? And that, that to me is probably another, and it links in with a civic purpose of universities. But, but how, do you, how do you enact that proposition so that people see the value of it? And it goes beyond, uh the concept of place to a certain extent, mm -hmm. uh, because of course we are uh, the university of this region. Uh, this is a very fast growing region because of the investment that's going into Western Sydney around the uh, Nancy Bird Walton International Airport and all of the other extraordinary investments being made into health infrastructure and transport infrastructure and the arts, the powerhouse as an example in Parramatta. So this is a transformational period for our region. But notwithstanding that, Western Sydney University and all of its um, previous incarnations, whether it's be the Colleges of Advanced Education that came together to form the University of Western Sydney in 1989 or the Hawkesbury Agricultural College dating back to 1891, we've had a long connection with tertiary education in the region. So it's natural that Western Sydney University is a region, is a university for our region. But it's in understanding the characteristics of our region that that comes to life. You know, we are a region with a, with a very successful multicultural uh, milieu in, in this region. You know, we have 170 different ethnic uh, communities um, interwoven into this region and remarkably successfully, I might add. We still have. Um, very significant pockets of educational disadvantage here by virtue of the nature of the way in which Western Sydney developed. And these new investments will change the socioeconomic context of the region, which is great because we need social mobility. We need that, uh, those economic, uh, in those economic uh, circumstances to actually drive uh, social mobility. And that's very, very important. It's a delicate balance, but the university provides the graduates mm. that help to enable that success in our region. And so many of our graduates remain uh, very much in our region. So it's not simply about place, but it's also about the type of um, community that we serve and communities that we serve because Western Sydney is not a homogenous part of Australia. It's a very heterogeneous part of Australia. Mm -hmm. and the, the Northwest is very different to the Southwest and Western Sydney and 
so on. So it's, a, it, it's made of, of smaller cities that come together mm -hmm. to form this region. And so understanding that multi-campus context we operate in is a really important part of saying we, we're here to support educational advantage, educational opportunity. We're here to recognize it's still 65% of our students are first in family to go to university. Just today I've had uh, I've been at uh, two graduation ceremonies and they're always wonderful events mm -hmm. because we understand that so many of those students walking, graduates walking across the stage um, are the first in their family to go to university. So uh, it's not just a life-changing moment for them, but their entire family is seeing for the first time what higher education, how important it is, how transformative it is. And if we're still having 65% of our students first in family, we still have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. in this region to continue to uh, lift aspirations around uh, access and participation in higher education and success in higher education. So the reason I wanted to start by being not just about place is because those elements are really important to our university and they're replicated wherever we're involved in teaching and learning around the world. And, and that's and the nature of Australian higher ed is that we're internationalized, mm -hmm. uh, but that ethos of our institution the values we bring are reflected in all of our activities and, and reflect, I think, our success in the Times, Times Higher Education Impact Rankings this year. Can I um, revert the attention back to you? And, and you've already uh, articulated this, but what's important to you as an educator? And were there specific opportunities that you took advantage of that were fundamental to the ideas that you've enacted in your professional career? Look, I was very fortunate um, to be able to, uh, to, to grow up in a period in Australia, not an easy period by any means, but a period where, uh, although many, many of my, uh, my friends at, at, at high school never went on to university because it was a, a working class high school in Geelong, we'd refer it to it that way at the time. Um, I grew up in a, in a working class area, housing commission area of, uh, of Geelong, uh, which meant, you know, it, it, was a, it was a challenging childhood, but I had a great childhood. And my parents were very committed to education for all of the children in the family. And so my sister went to university. I wasn't the first in family to go to university. My sister went to Melbourne University, the uh, two years before I did, and I followed her the year after. My brothers after that did not go on to university. They went into other forms of, uh, of, of uh, trade qualifications and other things. So I was fortunate to have that opportunity at that time to go to university. So I appreciated this was not something that everyone is able to take advantage of. And that sense of providing purpose uh, in whatever I did in life has been important to me. And you, you mentioned the, some of the universities that I've had an opportunity to, uh, to work in. And that began at what, what was the University of Ballarat, Ballarat University College. So it was mm -hmm. a regional, small regional university in Victoria, serving a very interesting community in, in the Western part of Victoria. Uh, from there to Curtin University. And again, Curtin is a, is a university supporting a very important community around it's Bentley campus. Then to Newcastle and the Hunter and the Upper Hunter and the Central Coast with really beginning to see significant educational disadvantage and needing to be creative and innovative as a university to address that educational disadvantage. And then I had the opportunity, an incredible opportunity to be the Vice Chancellor at a university like Charles Darwin University in the Northern Territory, which I think is such an important university. 29% of its students are uh, Indigenous. Australians, uh, more than any other university by an order of magnitude, many of them in vocational training, it's a dual sector university, but it's a university that is embedded in the fabric of the Northern Territory in, a, in, in very, very challenging circumstances to address educational disadvantage. But I know from the experiences there that higher education or tertiary education, uh, I, I have wonderful memories of the graduation ceremonies at CDU where you're not only seeing PhDs graduate in tropical medicine through the Menzies School of Health Research, or you're seeing some of the most extraordinary environmental scientists that are 
coming through or people working in, in social policy in Northern Australia, getting a PhD. But you're also seeing students from remote communities who have done a CERT one in rural operations or essential services. And they're also graduating in the same ceremony. And to talk to them about this opportunity to succeed and the difference it can make to their life and to their circumstances. That's a, that's a powerful driver, I think, for anyone who has a privilege to lead an Australian university. So when the opportunity came to, to see if I'd be successful with Western Sydney University, University of Western Sydney as it was at the time, again, this resonated because mm -hmm. of the work of my predecessor, Jan Reed, and the vice chancellors before her that appreciated just how extraordinary Western Sydney was. Uh, and the great responsibility we carried to ensure our university was as open to that community and as uplifting as it could be. So from my perspective, that continued purpose, the transformative nature of education, something I believe deeply in, mm -hmm. uh, has driven me uh, throughout my career and has, if you like, guided me to the institutions that I've wanted to work in and contribute to and to the sector more broadly. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I'm not sure if that exactly answers your question, but that's, no, it does. that's my sort of connection to education. So it does start with your early experiences in life and the friendships you make in, in my case, in a, in a struggling part of, uh, of industrial Geelong through to, you know, what we can do in this period of transformation in Western Sydney. So as, as I'm hearing you talk, I hear passion, I hear commitment. And I hear grit. What sustains you? Because the job of a vice chancellor in the current environment is particularly challenging because of the uncertainties and the ambiguities of government policy. So what, what sustains you? What, what makes you get up every morning and come into the office? <clears throat> well, the job's undone. Um, I think it's very interesting that Jason Clare's first speech as the new minister for education at the major speech at the UA conference uh, in June. Everyone saw that as a very important moment. It was a powerful speech mm -hmm. uh, to that room of you know, hundreds of people wanting to hear from the new minister about his priorities. And he touched on a number of things, but, but the core for the new minister was the work that he felt still needed to be done to ensure that uh, that uh, the equity and the diversity of our sector is something that we embrace and that we ensure everyone has that opportunity who has the capacity to come and study in higher education has the opportunity to do so, irrespective of their postcode or their educational background. We need to provide pathways. And his commitment to continuing the work that Denise Bradley did and uh, in producing her quite extraordinary report mm -hmm. around low SES students and, and the failure of our sector to really provide the educational opportunities that low SES students deserve and expect and that we needed to do more to address uh, in the Rudd, Gillard, Rudd period. And to hear the minister talk passionately about that and say, there is more here to be done. You know, this, you know, when we get up in the morning, to, to use your phrase, then we're thinking there is still more to be done here. There are still uh, opportunities that are not being met uh, that I think universities play a crucial role in, uh, uh, in delivering against. That's only in the context of the, the teaching and learning component of it. And I think one of the other great joys and privileges any vice chancellor has is to nurture research in our institutions. And for a lot of it, research that is at that nexus with teaching and learning. So, you know, we get the great benefits of the cross fertilization of teaching and research, but also some of the great curiosity driven fundamental research in our institutions. And then some of this incredibly important applied research going on. And I know we have it here as every university has outstanding research capability. That again is a great privilege to see, well, how can we ensure in the public good, we can advance the knowledge and the dissemination of knowledge, not just through our graduates, but through our research output. And where, where appropriate and, and uh, where the opportunity exists, how can we commercialize that for the benefit of the country? So those things force you to get up in the morning 
-hmm. and say, yeah, look, I, job's not done uh, yet. And, uh, you know, vice chancellors are, are always in that uniquely privileged position of having access to government in various ways to try and influence policy. So we all have a view about what's, what needs reform. And we have views on what would make a better, fairer, more, more equitable system of higher education in this country. And to be able to try and influence the politicians and the policymakers around that, that's another driver to think, mm -hmm. okay, this is a unique moment. Mm -hmm. um, and if I have access and if the ideas are evidence-based and compelling enough, then there's an obligation to put them before governments, state and federal, and try and move them towards better policy. So that's another reason I think we all feel there's there's a lot of work to be done. And just in closing, Barney, what advice would you give to your younger self? And what would you say to inspiring senior leaders in the sector? So two questions. To my younger self, um, I'm not sure that I have anything profound I'd say to the younger Barney. Um, maybe I'd say to him, you know, you really, you know, Barney, you don't need to spend quite as much time studying um, and you're still going to do okay. Um, maybe uh, in some of those moments where you enjoyed those lectures so much, uh, maybe uh, when you're younger, you need to take advantage of every opportunity that presents itself. And I think that might have been a message. I think my pathway, I hope, would have been the same for a whole raft of reasons you know family i have is wonderful and grandchildren are wonderful and and i love having been in higher education um now well i've been in education since uh, 1964 so i was reflecting this morning before coming on to do the podcast i was thinking goodness gracious if we we're doing this with judith in 2024 i'd be 60 years <laughs> in education um I was very obviously very young at the beginning, um, but that's a lifetime in education and, and I don't regret that for a minute. And I hope the pathway would be the same. In terms of the leaders of the sector, I think there's one thing I, I message I often uh, want to send to my colleagues in the sector. And that is that uh, we need to do more in leadership development in higher education, in my view, Judith. I know you've been a great contributor to this yourself. You've been one of those leaders who appreciated that we don't naturally come into these senior roles with the skills and the knowledge that we need to be as successful as we'd like to be or as we need to be or as we should be. And I think we're often uh, reluctant for whatever reason uh, to engage in really high quality leadership development in higher education. And, and the LH Martin and, and various other uh, organizations have done great things and continue to do great things, but it's not at the scale I think that's necessary for the benefit of higher education. So I'd say to Universities Australia and to the University Chancellors Council, I'd say we need to do better on providing professional development and educational opportunities and leadership opportunities for those in senior positions in universities, including vice chancellors, early in their careers so that they might learn a little more from each other and from those more experienced in the sector about leadership and the challenges it brings. A few years ago, I had the uh, privilege as chair of UA to attend the, uh, the annual uh, presidents, new presidents uh, meeting in Canada, the mm -hmm. University of Canada. And I went along and this is held every year. It was in January in Montreal, so it was you weren't going outside. So you're inside um, a hotel in Montreal. And they're about, because of the size of the Canadian system, you know, they had about 15 to 20 uh, new presidents who've been in higher education between, some of them were coming up to the beginning of their first term. Some had been there for a year or so. They came together and over the course of two days, a number of people came and spoke to them about the challenges of leadership in education. And I found it was a very valuable experience. I spoke about Australian higher mm -hmm. education and some of the challenges we have. I think there's an area that needs attention, Judith. So I would hope that as a sector, we can start to do more of the masterclasses that uh, 
our UA meetings, our, our UA um, conferences are a, an interesting step, but I think there's more we can do. On that really positive note, and that sort of reimagining note, thank you, Barney, for uh, giving me uh, 40 minutes of your time today. I've enjoyed it. I hope you've enjoyed it. I have, Judith. Good to talk to you. Really enjoyed it. Likewise. Okay. Enjoy your more graduations. Okay. Bye. See you later. Visit studiosity.com slash students first for the next Students First Symposium, an open forum for faculty, staff and academics to candidly discuss and progress the issues that matter most in higher education. studiosity.com slash students first